Monday mornings with Matt and Kevin. And you do that to kids, you know, you, you do that to kids who maybe can't rationalize, they can't reason, they can't think through things like an adult can, and their conscience is softened. Hey, so. I, I actually disagree with you. You're being way too nice to today's adults. I don't think adults <laughs> these days can <laughs> rationalize anything. This is true. I, I think, this I think is we have true. a bunch of a bunch this of men and true. women babies. What's in the news? Kind of technically at war with Russia, and Russia says, "Okay, you're going to sanction us, and we're going to shut off yeah. all of your gas. So have fun." Topics that come up around the dinner table will be given the truth treatment with no punches held and no falsehood left standing. And the the solution to all of this, again, as we know from, from the saints, from the mystics, is praying the rosary. I feel like there are not people in this world praying the rosary to the degree that we should, to the degree that we have to, and it's allowed darkness, principalities, demons to wander this world. These two will debate real-life issues from a Catholic perspective every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern. Make the world Catholic again. And yes, we are up and rolling for the first time ever. I'm very glad to be joined by Matt talking about all sorts of topics, kind of anything that interested us from the week before, possibly from the week following or well maybe from 15 17 it's kind of depending whatever we want to talk about and we're going to give you our opinions and keep in mind if you need advice regarding faith and morals then go talk to a priest if you need advice regarding your health go talk to a doctor if you need advice regarding politics go talk to a clown and otherwise we're just two guys here <laughs> having a conversation and today we're going to talk we have some really great content I, I i hope i think we've already done a couple of our interviews one is with a fellow from canada who is a subject of the queen who passed away so we'll talk about queen elizabeth ii and her passing and what that means for the country and for the world we will also talk with a a british fella who well, he's, he's doing his best to convert the Taliban. That's, that's all I'm going to say. You're going to have to listen for this. At the end of the show, this is a fascinating, absolutely intriguing interview with, with Miles. What's his name again, Matt? Yeah, it's Miles Rutledge. Miles Rutledge. That, that's a perfectly British name. Miles Rutledge. Perfect. What, a, what, a, Perfect. what a name. And, Hopefully, and, future, future king. Future King Miles Rutledge. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, and, and we're also going to talk about today, we're going to talk about the energy crisis in Germany, uh, some other politics, church politics, Novus Ordo politics, I should say, in Germany, and then some crazy, crazy, crazy stuff going on with our children's programming, especially in America. So, Matt, thanks for, for, for joining me. I'm excited about this show and excited to get rolling. Yeah, I mean, just just to be here and to kind of start this conversation off, I think is going to be just a lot of fun. So I hope our listeners that are, are tuning in, I hope they enjoy it. I hope they um, certainly take part in the comments section in YouTube as well. So anytime you're, you're listening and you want to chime in, give a, uh, a thought, an idea, an expression, even a comment or a critique, um, put it in there, let us know, take part of the discussion. We, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Just please no no vulgarities because I'm the one who has to edit the comments and they're already bad now. Yeah, Kevin so Kevin spam. moderates them, right? Oh, it's unbelievable. Right. It's terrible. And I have it's to moderate them job. all day long. So during work and stuff, and people people send me emails like, "Hey, Kevin, there's terrible comments on your on your YouTube channel. <laughs> what am I supposed yeah. to do?" Luckily, I I never get any uh, bad criticism, Kevin. Never. All of my my the the haters and the losers, as Trump would call them. <laughs> <laughs> through his presidency <laughs> they got nothing bad to say about you i miss i miss the mean tweets <laughs> <laughs> this is true this is true go over to go over to truth social i suppose if you want the the, yeah. the, the, the trump yeah. meanness anymore um but you speaking speaking of trump and something that he warned about actually famously a couple of years ago he while did. he was i believe he was visiting <clears throat> europe and he was sitting around saying hey you know guys if if you don't watch out you're going to be totally beholden to russia and russia energy and russian gas and the germans and there's a famous video going around in the last few weeks of the germans just laughing like <laughs> you know kind of a very you know snooty hmm. british look on them you know, kind of, <laughs> we don't really care what's hmm. going on and um well here we are a few years later and germany is completely dependent on russian gas and well germany is at least 
kind of technically at war with Russia and Russia says, okay, you're going to sanction us in and we're going to shut off yeah. all of your gas. So have fun. Right. 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 It's part of the game you play, Kevin. And I, I was doing some reading on this earlier and um, I saw that, you know, I know you're in Germany, but 14% of families in Britain are already behind on their bills. I mean, not just Germany, not just Britain, but all of Europe has relied on Russia for its fossil fuels. And we've got a combination here of sanctions, you know, COVID lockdowns, weather, even I heard being a problem up there. I'm in, I'm in the US, but uh, all these factors coming into play that is, have really, you know, taken a hit on Europe's uh, energy problem. And that Nord Stream of one pipeline, you know, that's, that's the pipeline that streams the gas from St. Petersburg and Russia straight to Germany. Um, and there's sanctions, you know, you, you want to pay for this gas and you want to pay for all of these things that are going up. Okay. High prices, high demand, whatever. Um, they're crippling everything and they know it. And as you said, Trump warned of this, he, he knew the repercussions of it. And, you know, I can't help but think as I, as I, my mind tends to, you know, kind of go to this direction, but is this orchestrated? I always have that in the back of my head, you know, is, is there a higher plan? Do you think there's a higher, um, I don't know. Is there some orchestrated event where these things are all kind of just, you know, part of the part of the big picture of these world elites? What do you think? Well, e either either it's planned or they're just remarkably stupid or both. And I, I honestly can't really decide which one it is. And it really could be both. But but it, for example, when this when mm. they first uh, went to war or kind of went to war with Russia, the the head of the UN, uh, what's her name, Van der Leyen, I think. She said, you know, we're doing this and it's going to be it's going to be at a great cost and it's a sacrifice that we should be willing to make, blah, blah, blah. And we know it's going to be hard and there's going to be, you know, struggles, et cetera. And so they knew it was coming. They, they knew very well that if they sanctioned Russia, Russia, Russia was going to shut off their gas. You know what they didn't do? Right. They didn't prepare their nuclear um, power stations, which they've had shut down for several years now. And they, it's just coming out in the news now. That the, the stations or the nuclear experts are saying, nope, sorry, we don't have time to be able to restart them for this year. Now, they haven't answered if they would have had time if they had started looking into that back when they declared a war on Russia. So, again, either mm. either these people are just they're just stupid. They're, they're just really dumb. They're really bad leaders or or they are or they're orchestrating. They, they want chaos. They want catastrophe because they know mm. when you have this, you have as you know power, but especially money going from you know the, the lower class and middle class just straight to the top yeah oh yeah and and putin this is not a surprise though and that's the thing um I, in june putin was saying that he was going to do this you know he he said um the economy of imaginary wealth is being inevitably replaced by the economy of in, of hard assets you know like the wealth of a country isn't necessarily dependent on its money it's 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 a monetary you know flow it's it's really dependent on a lot of its resources and if he can hold this back you know europe has to pay take these sanctions off me or pay up and that's the thing i think with with russia as a whole is they've got so many resources they've got a lot of assets that speak bigger than money does you know they 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 pipeline to europe they they've got all of this um you know this this these natural resources that you know putin can look at all europe and say you know drain your bank account we're here but you know, here's the price. And, and what's hard is that I think a lot of these people, um, and we see this here in the US too, especially with the COVID lockdowns. I don't know if you remember, but when the lockdowns happened in 2020, there's a famous video that went around of Nancy Pelosi showcasing her $20,000 freezer and all her ice cream flavors and all her. Uh, so, you know, there's that famous saying, they don't have bread, let them eat cake. She never said that, but I, Marie Antoinette never said that, but a lot of these people are very much removed. I've heard talk, I don't know how true it is, but that Vladimir Putin is the wealthiest man in the world. His, his, um, the state of Russia, all of his assets, nobody, not um, Elon Musk, right, comes close. He's got multiple, possibly trillions of dollars of wealth. Uh, do they care about you? I don't know. And I think these people are so far removed from everyday life. Um, and then they talk to you about, you know, I understand what it's like, you know, to, to have to put, you know, food on the table. I don't know. A lot of years have gone by where they they live in, in, in their, their, their golden towers and they kind of don't care. I feel like well, what, what well, they Pete, do and Pete, they, they, they want money and they want money. Pete, Pete Buttigieg, who is the the head of transportation in the U.S., yeah, came uh, out yes, and said, yes, hey, we're very fortunate. Yeah, right. I know. Right. What a guy. Uh, he, he came out and said, 
<laughs> hey, you know, if more people got uh, electric cars, then we'd have less of a gas mm -hmm. problem. Do you know how much the average e-car, I just saw this on Twitter, I believe, it's $67,000 mm -hmm. for a, right. I guess that's maybe that's a Tesla, but this is for an elect electric car. So these are extremely expensive. This is something that most people just simply cannot afford. And again, it, these people have no base in reality. Now, I, I think someone like Buttigieg mm -hmm. is just not right. a very bright person. But it's one of those things that they want in, in Germany. Again, they, they want us that they want to get rid of, of diesel cars. They want to get rid of gasoline and they want to do this by, I don't know, 2035 or something of, of the, the sort. And they want to get on a, a total electric grid for these cars. And they don't ever consider, well, where's the power coming from to to actually be able to have an electric grid? These people are just they, yeah. they just don't think yeah. these things through. They just think this is where we want to go. But how do we get there? Duh. Right, right, right. And there was even this uh, this this footage that came out in in the winter and um, pileups on highways. You know, snowstorm, strong winds, blizzard like conditions, and you got cars stranded for miles, kilometers, whatever country you may be in. Um, and you know, people are running out of they're running out of gas. Uh, how would you get these cars electrically charged? It's not feasible. Um, the resources just aren't available and yeah like you said and, and i know this was a big discourse on twitter but people can't afford the gas prices though so the solution is to buy a seventy thousand dollar car that that's that's how we solve this and even just jumping back to that energy crisis you know i i've read that all european leaders for the most part they're trying to hold their ground here they're saying we're not going to release sanctions on russia we're not gonna return to you for our our resources we're gonna look other in other places we're going to try to find an alternative and trump pushed that when he was president uh resources need to be made available to the people in their own countries as as, as best as possible and when you rely on these other countries for these resources you're one war away you're one disagreement really away from a lot of these things changing from a lot of these things becoming suddenly pressing issues. Um, and again, the, the elites in our country, especially the Biden administration, they are so far removed from reality, from what the everyday American, from what the everyday European is dealing with that when it doesn't affect you out of sight, out of mind, I think it plays a big role in their decisions. And I think a lot of their moves, a lot of their decisions are calculated based on on poll numbers. I think that very few have actual morals, very few have actual um, set of, 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 what would you call it, like maybe standards or principles. They, they know how to work the clock. And even here, uh, the gas prices are, are lowering. They're, not, they're high, but they're not what they were. And, um, oh, look how good of a job the Democrats are doing. This is all calculated. It's all watch for elections, watch for midterms. They know what they're doing. They know how to play the game because they create problems and then they quote unquote solve them. And it's like, oh, look how great we're doing. And I think that that is played throughout the world, not just here well, in the well, US. At least in the US, though, you have a democratic issue. And in Germany, somewhat as well, yeah. which I mean, democracy is its own problem, which in the next in the next uh, segment, <clears> we're going <throat> to talk about more about the monarchy, which doesn't really exist either. But the UN is elected by. I don't know. Do you know? Do you know who elects the UN? The leaders of the UN? I don't know if anybody. Have knows. They are just. They no just kind of. Get There's ambassadors. Yeah, yeah. Like I remember. Um, during, I couldn't even tell you who our UN ambassador is now. I know it was Nikki Haley during the Trump administration years. She got appointed that position, but I tend to lean. <laughs> toward, this is controversial, but that these people are, for the most part, maybe not all of them, but for the most part, they're they're a part of a, a larger secret sect. Freemasonry, whatever you might have there. And um, I think a lot of these people dabble in it. And I think that um, they know it um, for the most part, most of them. I think there are a few people in these these uh, elite positions that might want to be doing good and might thinking that they're helping out. But I think there is a global scheme in a lot of different ways. And, uh, you know, certainly something we could touch upon in another conversation. Well, and, and even if you don't get down that rabbit hole of even Freemasonry or anything, just go look at the family trees of the U.S. presidents. Now, many, many of the U.S. presidents right. are related right. to each other. So so th th there's no question that yeah. there is a different society, a higher, quote unquote, society of people for sure yeah. in the Western world. That, that That is absolutely undeniable. Now, if it is if it's the Illuminati or the Freemasons or the Jews, I mean, I think they're all very valid possibilities. I, I don't really know, sure. but. But sure. it does sure. exist. Right. I agree. 
and they and they hate us and they hate us <clears throat> they do so what do you think kevin maybe some of our listeners can uh shoot some comments into the comment section kind of weigh in a little bit let us know their thoughts and um yeah if you've got a thought as to what you think the energy crisis might be like in your area or what you're facing personally maybe your family or or, or, or whatnot uh shoot us a comment and uh chime in and if you would like to send me um some animal furs or some blankets or sweaters or, or some good whiskey <laughs> to stay warm this winter because we're surely going to be without power at some points please uh email me and then i will i will send you my address but matt thank you very much for that uh segment we're going to head on next to a fellow in canada that is a, a guy who's joined the show before nicholas Wansbutter. he is a lawyer in canada and a faithful son of the british monarchy i suppose you could say and we're going to get his opinions on the passing of the 96 year old queen elizabeth ii that is up next after a quick break And we're back and now talking with Nicholas Wandsbutter. He, he's been on the show before, and we want to talk to him about the Queen of England. And he's going to have a little bit of a better idea and better, I don't know, a better pers perspective about the now deceased Queen. May she rest in peace. And I want to just kind of hear what he thinks of her or thought of her as she was his monarch. He's from Canada. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the reaction after her death as well. So, Nicholas, I'm going to send it straight to you. And maybe just what, what are your impressions of, of the Queen? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me on again, Kevin. It's always a pleasure. And as you say, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, she was my queen because she is the Queen of Canada. She's the person who I swore my oath as a barrister to because living in a monarchy, I don't swear things like that to the Constitution or to the people of Canada. It's to Her Majesty the Queen. Also, the military oath that I took when I was a member of the uh, Canadian Army uh, Reserves, I swore that oath to Her Majesty the Queen. So um, her, her passing is something that, I guess, gives me some mixed feelings. For mostly, there's the natural sadness when anyone dies and the sadness when someone dies who most likely by all appearances died without the sacraments and without the Catholic faith. Also, there's the sadness of it's the end of an era. Uh, she wasn't just the queen for my entire life. She was the queen for my parents' entire life. Uh, she, she was crowned in 1953. So about 70 years, she was the, the queen of Canada, queen of Great Britain, and the rest of the Commonwealth countries that haven't gone Republican. It's, so it's a it's a an end of an era, and it's another death of the Canada that was and the British Empire that was. I mean, the British Empire was by no means perfect. It was a Protestant empire, which from a Catholic perspective is obviously a huge problem. But as far as empires go, it was pretty benign and uh, humanitarian, or humane at least, compared to many empires would compare to the mongol empire the ottoman empire the going back to the assyrian empire if we really want to go back and they they built up a lot if you look at the countries that were british colonies i mean look at them they have beautiful buildings they have great infrastructure they have law courts the system i work in i live in a british colony we have the legal system that i work in because of the british empire so there, there's that aspect of of her connection to the empire, which no longer exists. The empire was still rel look, by appearances relatively alive and well in 1953. I mean, it was already dead. It just hadn't started smelling yet in 1953. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the British, uh, they like to pretend that they won World War I and World War II, but those two wars completely annihilated their empire. So, um, so, I mean, it was already on the way out, but she still has that connection to that because it was still around at the time and then now uh, i mean i have to borrow a phrase from from tucker carlson because he just put it so well he said today britain is a regional banking center slash refugee camp i mean that, that's basically what it's been reduced to from the empire it was now on a personal level like dealing with uh, queen elizabeth ii herself again it's a bit of a mixed bag 
objectively and with all respect, I have to say that she was probably one of the worst monarchs that Britain ever had. Uh, some people said she was the worst queen ever. I would say Elizabeth I was way worse. But, I, I mean, there's some comparisons between the two Elizabeths. Elizabeth I oversaw and implemented the end of Catholicism in England. Elizabeth II oversaw and didn't really implement because she was a figurehead, but did oversee the rest, the destruction of the rest of England, the, the culture, the, the language, the, the, the people, and the, and the empire. The, I mean, England is not really England anymore. Same as Canada isn't Canada anymore, really. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, living in various modern countries today might say the same thing about their, their lands. So, uh, you know, she has to, she bears a responsibility for that. As I say, she was a figurehead, so she doesn't have full responsibility, but she still had a role to play in the, uh, the dissolution of the empire and of English society by virtue of the fact that she still had as a figurehead that um, she still had a role. She still had influence she uh, also, in law, has the ability to uh, refuse any law. So, I mean, the, the queen, she has the power that a president has, right? You sometimes hear for American viewers, they'll hear about the presidential veto. Well, the queen has a veto, or the king now, has that same veto when laws pass the House of Commons. They then have to go through the, the Senate or the House of Lords in, in Britain. And then it has to get the final signature by the queen, same as how it has to go through the... Uh, House of Representatives, Senate, and then to the president to pass into law in the United States. So in law, she had that power. In practice, she never used it once that I'm aware of. And so there, there's a responsibility there as well. Uh, some might say, well, yeah, you know, they would have gone republic. They would have dissol dissolved the monarchy if she did that, which, well, what good is the monarchy if it's not using any of its power anyway might as well go down go down fighting go down in flames uh right and it's an interesting question i mean was she just was she not a fighter was she scared of losing the, the monarchy but as you said if it just becomes symbolic then what's the point is it was it just a selfish self-protective desire or or what do you what's your opinion I actually don't think it was a selfish thing i think it was a misguided uh selfless view because Really, the last um, true monarch that Britain had would have been, I think, Charles II, who was, uh, if I'm getting my numbers and, and times right, he was, uh, you know, there was the so-called glorious revolution, uh, Oliver Cromwell, you know, I mean, they executed Charles II, they, they didn't want uh, his son, uh, uh, the name's escaping me, it starts with a J, um, uh, James, I'm always saying the Jacobites, I'm thinking, I can think of the Latin version, what's the English version of that name? Um, you know, they didn't want him to be crowned. Uh, and so the monarchy was reinstituted after that, the Glorious Revolution, after a time period of Cromwell and the Puritans running the country. But when it was reestablished, it was a shadow of its former self, and it continued to lose power and influence as time went on. And there developed this tradition of the monarch not interfering with the quote unquote will of the people. I think that Her Majesty was infected with that same democratism that almost everyone in Western society is today, this essentially religious fervor that democracy is the be all and the end all. And, and you can only govern if you have the will of the people as expressed in the ballot box. So, uh, my impression is that she legitimately believed in that stuff. So it wasn't self-serving. It was self-sacrificing from her perspective because she thought, well, you know, I don't have the, the mandate from the ballot box. So therefore it would be improper for me to exercise my powers. That, that's my impression of why she never used her power. And, and you certainly hear that sort of, commentary from the various governors general and lieutenant governors, uh, I mean, certainly in Canada, uh, about why they never exercise that power on behalf of the queen. Uh, now that I mean, that said, I, I, I'd be willing to guarantee you that if uh, some really like an actually right wing government took power, and they tried, say, outlawing abortion or something, then all of a sudden, I could see uh, the, the monarch, if there still is one, saying, no, 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 this this is the time we need to 
we need to use our power. This is this is what it's for, is to uh, deny something like that. And I mean, you, an example of that is in Alberta, the uh, Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, which is one of the Western provinces in Canada, has already come out in the media saying that if uh, one of the leadership candidates for the United Conservative Party in Alberta wins and they pass this uh, sovereignty act that they are saying they want to pass, which would uh, not to get into it too much, but it would basically give Alberta more autonomy if they pass this law. The lieutenant governor has already said, if they do that, I'm going to veto it. Wow. So there's that whole democracy thing, but man, there's this infection of leftism that somehow it's okay to be authoritarian when you're left, but it's not okay to be authoritarian when you're right. And, you know, and we see that in all different, I mean, the whole, you see leftists acting authoritarian all the time and the media is, you know, just congratulating them on, you know, they made a strong, a strong stand or made a strong move. And, and do you think, is it possible for Charles the third now, right? Charles the third, is it right. possible for him to dissolve parliament and just say, all right, y'all, you know, we're back to true monarchy or is that just not even, is that, I mean, is that like legally possible or would he have to bring in the military and, and yeah, it, well, it's legal. Out? Well, I know for Canada, for sure, that would not legally be possible because mm. the, the constitution entrenches the house of commons in the senate so he couldn't do that in places like canada um for the united kingdom i'm not actually sure whether they have a formal constitution or not i i but in practice it could never be done because the people wouldn't support it the military wouldn't support it. i mean if you want to see a military coup happen in a western democracy that's how you make it happen doing something like that well it's interesting in and, and, and it's as you say, I mean, democracy is is lauded as this as the greatest thing since sliced bread. And it's if you look, I mean, I mean, it's really led us a lot of the times to to a lot of the, the sins we see in society, right? I mean, to, to the sins say, of say 100 percent of the time. Yeah, name, sure. Name, right. Yeah. Name, absolutely. Name, me one demo, name me one democracy that hasn't ended the way ours is ending right now. I mean, people yeah, say, I mean, oh, Gabriel Garcia Moreno. Well, he got assassinated <laughs> after two years in office. So that doesn't count. Right. <laughs> That's a good point. It, it, it's a sad point. And, it, and it's something that, that at, before I let you go, I do want to comment real quickly on on the effect that the death has had around social media circles and how people reacted to it. And I know that you were as disappointed as I was to see the vitriol and the just nastiness come out, even in Catholic circles after her death. And I don't, what, what are your thoughts on that? And how should people act, even if it's someone that we don't like or appreciate when when they die yeah it, i was i i don't know if i'd say disappointed because i wasn't really surprised but i i, th I think it's terrible when you see people saying they they wish that she died in agony people calling her unmentionable words that i won't uh i won't uh dirty your show with with uh repeating and as you say even among catholics I've seen so-called Catholic people, traditional Catholic people rejoicing over the fact that, oh, she's burning in hell now. I mean, I think that's a terrible, terrible un-Catholic approach. I mean, that is the worst thing that could possibly happen to someone to go to hell and suffer eternal damnation. That is not something to, to celebrate. Uh, I, I mean, so you're, I, I mean, it's so unchristian. I mean, have you ever prayed the pater? I mean, it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Man, I would not want to face the judgment throne of God if that's the way I I forgive the trespasses of others. Because if that's how I'm going to get my trespasses uh, forgiven, uh, it, it's it's not going to be good. So I, I think that's a big problem just from a basic charity. I mean, even if it's a terrible person, a mass murderer or something, their death and quite possible damnation is not something to celebrate. Uh, it might be something. To, it would be something to celebrate if she'd had a deathbed conversion, received the sacraments from a traditional priest. That would be something to celebrate. I, I think it's also extremely problematic that people are so disrespectful to the office of of the the king or queen, and that that's something. I mean, even the prime ministers. I mean, I'm not a fan of democracy at all. I think it's a terrible form of government, as as listeners can probably guess. But I've been like, I you you see stuff like people. Uh, you know, the let's go Brandon in the US or the, the, the F Trudeau flags you see around Canada. I mean, that that is not a Catholic way of uh, at behaving towards authority. These people were placed 
in their positions of authority above us by God, like it or not. Yes, a lot of them are terrible people, or I mean, maybe we don't really know whether they're terrible people. We can say their policies are terrible and they're they're hurting us and they're hurting people, but you still respect the office. You maybe you don't like the, the man or the person, but I, I think from a Catholic perspective, it's very important to to keep that in mind and be respectful. I mean, because you start going down that path. Well, what if there's a priest you don't like? You don't need to respect his priestly dignity because he's not a nice person. And I mean, not all pre priests are human beings. Not all of them are going to be nice people. Not all bishops are going to be nice people. I mean, I, I think the bishops we have generally are, are from any time I've experienced them, they're, they're, you know, they conduct themselves in a, in a good way and they're kind to people, but you could easily have a bishop one day who's really not a nice person, but he's still a bishop. So you still, kiss his ring you still call me your excellency and you're respectful and same with the same with priests well and, and it goes all the way down to the family right i mean it your, your kids see how you treat other authority as well i mean it's it's a it all goes around in a circle right i mean if i treat sure if it's biden if it's the queen and, and i start trashing them and bad mouthing them and my kids see it then they wh how are they going to understand how they're supposed to respect their superiors me and, and and others, you know, in the priests and the bishops, etc. If I don't do it likewise, and I, I think that that's it's so easy to forget because we get so into this political realm and this hyperbolic. Everything's so hyperbolic now. Everything is the worst, and everything's evil. And he, he this guy is he's a Freemason, and and she's the worst, you know, most evil, you know, child eating person of all time. And it's like, uh, calm down, guys. I mean, reptilian alien. Exactly, exactly. And, and I mean, honestly, part of it is because the internet is so filled with craziness and, and and i mean even if some of it's true you make a great point even if let's say let's say the queen of england was this the worst person of all time how do we as catholics handle that do we go around and, and call her bad names and say that we're glad she's in hell you're, you're you're exactly right even if it were true even if if she was terrible that is not how we act as catholics always remember to be charitable and to forgive christ said forgive 70 times seven times i mean it's that is well, one of the yeah. primary tenets of our faith and, it, and it's the basic uh hate the sin love the sinner right i mean you can have very strong things to say about policies and actions taken by these uh, political leaders but you still respect the 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 office exactly perfect Nicholas, I really appreciate it. We got to run. Um, I, I hope to have you on again. Have you on again sometime? Until next time, thanks so much for your comments on the Queen. May she rest in peace. Until next time, God bless. All right. Thank you. And God save the King. And we're back. And we're talking about now a topic that's even less pleasant than the death of a monarch. I'd say much, much less pleasant, honestly. And that is talking about the disturbing, the, the, the I don't even know the words for it, the, the, the attempt to degrade and to, to destroy our children in, in America, especially, and in doing that through <clears throat> media. And we're going to talk about a few different things. We want to talk about also what the, the Catholic, quote unquote, Catholic Church in the U.S. is also proposing. But first of all, Matt, we came across, I think it was yesterday or a few days ago, this mm. this TV yeah. show that is that is produced partly by Disney and partly by Fox. I believe it's it's published on FXX, which I assume is Fox. And this show is called what? What's the name of the show again, Matt? Yeah, I, I have it here. I actually wanted to read the description that the that Disney actually gave. I, I pulled it up for us and, and the listeners. So the show is called um, Little Demon. That's actually the, the name of the show. Now, listen very carefully. This is the description that Disney gave to the title. And I'll, this is, quote, 13 years, brace yourselves, 13 years after being impregnated by Satan, a reluctant mother, Laura, and her antichrist daughter, Chrissy, attempt to live an ordinary life in Delaware, but they are constantly thwarted by monstrous forces, including Satan, who yearns for the custody of his daughter's soul, period, end quote. That is the official show description. 
And <laughs> the, the first thought that came to my mind was, okay, someone had to sit there in these high ranking, high profile Disney offices and say, you know what? Why don't we make a show that is like, that curtails around this? And one of the actresses, they interviewed her in, in, a, in the article that I read, I believe we're going to post the, the link to the article, maybe in the show notes or in the comment section, whatever, so people could actually take a look at this and see. She said, I love that we're normalizing paganism. And it makes you think, you know, I, I, this is totally unrelated, but there was a time when, when Justin Trudeau of Canada released a message to children and he actually said parents leave the room for a minute i want to talk to your kids and this has become an issue i think that has really um taken on such precedence where they no longer try to hide it i think there was always some sort of subliminal messaging some always, always some content that they tried to sneak in and and you know relate to kids in a, in a way that kind of demonstrated that they do want to influence your children but now at this point we have gone all out we have gone completely to the point where they're making shows for children i think they said their their audience range they want anyways 18 to 24 i or 34 i never knew that disney curtailed to older audiences <laughs> uh but um kids are going to be looking at these things and I think we're not far removed. You and I actually talked about this a little bit in our in our show we did together a week or so ago. Um, t throw this out there 10 years ago, right? Put this in, you know, 2012. What would the reception have been? And and where are we now? I think there has been such a a shift in in narrative that they are openly admitting all of these things. And again, the show is called Little Demon. Um, you know, and the question becomes, Kevin, is what do you do? What do you think? You have children as a parent. Um, how do you how do you say, you know, I want my kids to maybe see this Disney film that came out in the 80s, the 90s, the 50s, whatever, and they become interested and then they say, Oh, well, you know, I, I want to read more about Disney. How do you think you as 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 a father uh protect your kids from these things? Do you shut out the world? Do you say, don't watch Disney ever again? Don't look at the TV? What do you think is, is a good balance here? And well, I'm, well, I'm sure some of our our listeners can weigh in, but what do you think? Uh, yeah, it, it, people should, because we have a pretty extreme view. I, I, I don't know if everyone does it the way we do it, but we don't have a TV hmm. and our kids just aren't going to watch any of that stuff. Um, if, if they watch anything ever, it's going to be extremely controlled. And part of that is mm. because of the research that I've done for certain podcasts. When I've looked into these things, I've looked into what has been produced on Netflix, on Amazon and by Disney. And it's putrid. I, I mean, some of the stuff truly, I mean, especially on Netflix is it's not just immoral and impure. It is absolutely diabolical and, 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 and blasphemous and, and literally does everything it can to throw mud and, and all other, other excrement in the face of Christianity. And how on earth is that something that we can give money to? And, they, and they're, they're not just platforming that. They are creating that, especially Netflix. And Netflix created a show. I don't remember the name of it, but but I could I could find that again. I actually did a podcast about it, which I can I can mm. link to it in this in this show as well. That, that is so grotesque, you can't even imagine it. And yet again, people and I know Catholics are still giving their money to Netflix. And I think it's 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 just purely because it, they're they're ignorant. They don't know these things, and that's why I think it's important to have these shows and talk about these important issues that I know not everyone is going to boycott Amazon. I boycott Amazon because I just chose, I, I decided, hey, this is a company I don't want to give my money to. But my main mm -hmm. point again, and I've had this in many different shows that I've talked about this topic, the question is, <clears throat> when you buy something, when you purchase something, when you watch something on TV, when you read a book, Why? That should always be the question. We, we've become so consumeristic. We're all consumers. All we want to do is, is have, 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 quick, 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 now, now, now. Is that really who we are? Shouldn't we be considering everything that we buy? If we watch a movie, if our kids watch a movie, we should sit down and say, hey, what is the message from this? What, what are they trying to tell us? And and if we yeah. can't sit there and say, hey, this is something that, that I want my kids to put in their heads, then of course they shouldn't be watching it. I mean, again, the, the description here, I mean, I, as you were talking, I reread the, just to make sure I, I understood this correctly, you know, it's it's hard to let it sink in. Like, is, is this what Disney and Fox are actually advertising? And yeah, the, the Satan is trying 
to yearn for the custody of his daughter's soul. What sort of battles? It says here they're they're being thwart, they're trying to live an ordinary life in Delaware. Why Delaware? I don't know where Joe Biden's from. Um, ha ha. <laughs> uh, they're constantly thwarted by monstrous forces. Um, what is going on? Like what? I, I haven't seen an episode. I don't think I want to see an episode. I don't know if if any episodes are out yet. I don't know if if this is something that you could actually watch. Um, and I would encourage anyone not to watch it to give any platform to this. But what could possibly be going on in these in these shows? Um, and, and, and I think too, there's always for, for whatever reason. There's well, I know the reason. There's always usually a stab somewhere at the Catholic Church. I think in all of these things, there's 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 always some sort of subliminal attempt to take a stab at the church because um, from, from Christ hanging on the cross to that moment in history to today, Satan has always waged war on the church and he's done so through the vicar of Christ. And so when we read the Antichrist, when we read these terms being just, you know, given to kids, is it to me, and this is just me thinking out loud here, is it some sort of normalization where you know what maybe the antichrist is not a bad guy maybe he's not something to be afraid of is he you know if he's in the world today if he's if the the actual antichrist himself is here among us um how will he be welcomed is this kind of making children is it shaping their conscience to you know be you know the antichrist might not be such a bad guy after all you know, who is he? Where is he? So when they hear it, actually, in real life, if, if we ever come to these days, um, you know, maybe he's 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 revered. I don't know. But I, I think there's always some sort of message that they're trying to send. Absolutely. And it's and it's always a bad one. And I, I tell you what I think that they found it. I think they found it through different ways mm. is that yeah. no one's going to stop. them. <clears throat> no, no one's going to stop them if they if they put up dress up a man as a woman and then they go and, and you know, drop their pants no one cares no one's going to do anything and they know it they, they've, they've done these things and they don't and they get away with it and and they've also say game of thrones yeah. you know they've had a show like game of thrones which every other week was just trying to outdo itself in its grossness and in its perverseness and they got away with mm -hmm. it and people loved it and watched it right. and so i mean i think that they've seen that okay we can do whatever we want and now on top of that i think you're totally right the normalization of it and I think it's really interesting that, that I've seen from the New York Times as well. They've had several very strange publications, one of them about normalizing cannibalism. I'm not kidding. Normalize, hmm. Normalizing cannibalism. I'll see if I can find that as well as New York Times. And, and I, I think it is it's this idea of paganism. It's this idea of almost anarchy. And, and, and there is no bad, actually. You know, the, the bad doesn't actually yeah. exist. Good and evil? Nah, that's just... That's what society mm. tries to tell you. That's what the, the bad, you know, the church that's trying to rule you is trying to tell you. They, they, they I think they want people to, yeah, be anarchist. They, they, they want to have no rules because they know that with that is, again, that's another way to, to make a society collapse. And I think ultimately right. that's where it seems it all leads. It seems like they, they <clears throat> want one way or another, if it's by, you know, immigra mass immigration, if it's by mass inflation, if it's by mass bad media they want society hmm. to fail they yeah this the isn't the first one percent <laughs> yeah 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 the the 99 percent are ruled by the the one percent this isn't the first time that this has happened too i i have a video i i believe that i've tweeted it before um if not i can certainly bring it up again uh the cartoon network maybe some years ago now they release i guess they're called like uh, a short or whatever, where it's kind of, it bridges programs. It, like you'll have a show, there'll be a little bridge, a short or whatever, and then it goes to the next, to the, the next show, kind of to, to, you know, fall in between time slots. And it was three um, figures with triangle shaped heads um, beating children. And I actually have the video. I can, I can somehow some way link this or, or, or post this. Um, and there's three platforms and they take little babies and then they, they bash them. And I have my camera on, so Kevin can see me, but the listeners cannot, but they, they bash them on this table. They throw them up in the air and then the baby starts crying and then the, they start to rip the baby apart and it's very graphic. And this was the cartoon network. So this is not, you know, some, some, you know, adult film here. Um, they rip the children apart 
And then at the very end of the clip, it's very solemn, dark music as well. The the three figures with the diamond shaped heads or triangle shaped heads, they they sort of lift their hands up in the air and the baby levitates. Like the, the, the babies kind of raise up in the air. And um I mean these people they they all curtail to the to the evil powers. I, I'm thinking of abortion. I'm thinking of 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 again these this almost normalizing of you know there's no such thing as good or evil it's, it's all just fun you know they're evil and uh, enjoy it you know watch it it's fun it's just it's it's made up it's a cartoon it's a show whatever like stop taking it so seriously they're trying to numb our brains they're trying to normalize looking at these extremely graphic dark images which <laughs> is exactly what satan would want to do you know the 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 make the devil look not so scary and you do that to kids, you know, you, you do that to kids who maybe can't rationalize, they can't reason, they can't think through things like an adult can, and their conscience is softened. Hey, so. I, I actually disagree with you. You're being way too nice to today's adults. I don't think adults <laughs> these days can <laughs> rationalize anything. This is true. I, I think, this I think is we true. have a bunch of, a bunch of men and true. women babies walking the earth, as I, I, I'm sure you would agree. And I think that, again, so these shows that are mm. fo focused at 18 to 24-year-olds, I, I, are they children or are they adults these days? I mean, honestly, the honest question, and I know this is being harsh, but a, am I wrong here? You know, can, can people actually make informed decisions on their own? You know, what, what they've been shaped and molded by media their entire lives. So if there's anything you want to hear from me, any, yeah. any advice before we go, I just want to tell you to, I'm not going to tell you to get off media. I mean, like, I'm going to go watch football tomorrow while I edit this, this radio show, you know, this, this podcast. And, I'm going to watch football and I love it. And I'm sure people would tell me not to do that. So everyone has their, their, their own line, but the most important thing in my opinion, again, is to think about it. Why am I doing this? Is it okay? Is, is this going to at the very least not negatively affect my soul? And, and if it will, yeah. and if you think Disney is trying to negatively affect your soul and your children's souls, then never give them a dime again. Right. Yeah. Um, and the the solution to all of this, again, as we know from from the saints, from the mystics is praying the rosary. I feel like there are not people in this world praying the rosary to the degree that we should, to the degree that we have to. And it's allowed darkness, principalities, demons to wander this world. I think there was once a time where the rosary, it fell into disuse. It did. And there were consequences to that. There were plagues because of that citing the, the, the rosary falling into disuse um we need to pray the rosary and that it, that will dispel heresy it, it will you know dissipate demonic activity there's so much fruit there's so much merit so if our listeners are not praying it they don't know how to pray it there's plenty of resources out there pick up your rosary start today um and engage in the spiritual battle which we are in and also engage with this content. You can comment on YouTube, on social media as well, Facebook, Twitter. Let us know what you think about this. What would you do? What? How do you act when you hear these things coming from Disney, from Fox, from Netflix, from Amazon? And, and really tell us what you think the option should be. Not necessarily, I'm not saying it should be a boycott, but what do you think it should be? Let us know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this segment as well, please like, share, subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends. Up next, we have Miles Rutledge. Uh, I, I, you you got to say just- The yeah, best just, British accent. That is the greatest Miles Rutledge. Name. Miles Rutledge, <laughs> oh, it's so good. And he's gonna tell you one of the most unbelievable stories you've ever heard about how he ended up rubbing elbows with the Taliban. And well, we hope and he hopes that maybe he'll just convert a few of them while he's at it. So up next, Miles will tell us his fascinating story Welcome back to the show. I have a very special guest for you all. He has been to the most dangerous parts of the world during the most dangerous times from the Taliban takeover in Kabul to Russia, invading Ukraine, to walking the streets of London alone <laughs> at night. Lord <laughs> Miles Rutledge is with me today. Miles, welcome. Thank you for having me on, man. Yeah, so let's just get right to it, Miles. So you were there among the Taliban. You went shooting with the Taliban. And yes. you're not afraid to live your Catholic faith. So people want to know, how have the Taliban 
perceived you? What is their tolerance towards other religions, especially uh, your Catholicism? Oh, they're more tolerant than most people in London anyway. Uh, <laughs> I joke, but it's pretty interesting. So uh, this gets a little bit uh, lawish. So the Taliban actually do have a rumour or kind of a prophecy that's hinted around. And I found out about it through social media when I popped down there. Turns out it's true. But they have a prophecy stating they're a follower of Christ. So a Western follower of Christ who's part of one of the nations that's invading them will return to the country or enter Afghanistan and sig- signify the end of foreign occupation. And I became famous in Afghanistan because I was the last ever tourist in Kabul, just there on innocent terms, wrong place, wrong time, and we have the right place at the right time. So they have this kind of idea around me that they think that I'm lucky almost, and even I'm Christian, which they don't approve of. They kind of like it to some degree. Um, I think I'm just a lucky charm to them. But... Every time I tell them I'm Catholic, they just look at each other for a second because it's so unheard of. Um, because you've got to remember that 99.99% of them are Muslim. So it just doesn't happen over there when someone directly tells them they're Catholic. And they freak out a little bit. But then you start speaking to them about things you've got in common. So, of course, in the Quran, they mention Mary. It's only woman mentions. So you start to speak about Mary in their terms. And you meet that common ground, same with Christ too. And they seem to get a little bit and they ease up just a ton. Um, and I've also had Taliban saying they'll throw me a party to try and convert me, trying to convert me to be Muslim, which I kind of see as an opportunity to do the opposites. And they don't expect it because they know that if I try and convert them or talk about Christ or Christianity in general, they'll, they'll you know, execute me. Then I push my luck and they just don't execute me. So it's it's an interesting one. I don't know why I'm not dead yet, but that's usually how it goes. And I try and nudge him in the right direction. I don't think I've converted anyone yet, but I always plan okay. to their mind. You never know. A good plan to the mind might work in a few years. Um, some of them are actually very snobby. So some Taliban, just because I'm white or Western, they won't shake my hand. And some of them, when they see the cross around my neck, so I openly walk around the ball with a cross they just spit on the floor. But until it escalates, I just smile at them and just nod and give this little goofy look. They just walk away. Sometimes I even say shalom to them just to annoy them. They won't do anything. Sure, sure. <laughs> so so you, you mentioned that um there was one point where you said, um, please don't execute me. Uh, do you think that they would actually is that something that you've actually felt threatened with? Like they, you know, they might actually take action here like they don't like this or have you felt that it was kind of you know with the relationship you might have had with some of the guys that it was more so lighthearted? i think it's somewhat lighthearted, but there's always going to be someone in one of these groups out with because i'm hanging out with 10 or so taliban at that time that just won't get it or just completely disagree with it and they might take it further because one word from a few of them will just absolutely demolish me so i've got to take it on faith that things will go correct and i do feel threatened by it sometimes but at the same time there's nothing to actually gain from it if it's not a dangerous situation because there's no reward of our risk right you gotta take a leap of faith quite literally um so in that situation i think you'll be kind of cool to get killed by the taliban because at least i'm doing it for a good cause <laughs> and not just doing it in say a senseless right. war or just uh because i was a dumb tourist Right. So I, maybe even hope it will happen, but uh, I'm not going to tempt fate too much. You know, I'm not going to test God. Right. D- don't put God to to the test. Right. So Miles, um, have there been times where um, now you just kind of touched on it a little bit, but where you've actually felt threatened? I know you said that there were times where it was like lighthearted, and uh, you know, you had to kind of trust that you know, like, all right, these guys really wouldn't do this. But um, living your faith out, like actually being in a country like this, where um, there's such extremism and we see on the news, you know, that, you know, uh, from what we've heard from all the way back to the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and so on, um, is that these are radical extremists. And so how do you actually set foot in these, in these lands, in these areas and, you know, practice your faith? What, it, what, what did you do there um, that, was uh, in accordance with practicing your faith? Did you pray? Did you pray the rosary? Did you um, do spiritual readings? Like, how did you live your faith there? Oh, absolutely. So before a trip, 
I pray a ton and I do pray consistently throughout, but specifically right before trip, I pray a ton and I say, you know, God, whatever happens, uh, it's the path you choose, but let me do something that's correct and right in your name. And if I die doing that, fair enough, prefer it wouldn't happen, but your choice, mate, you know, it's all good. So as soon as something bad happens, I am just extremely confident about it, almost arrogant, because I know no matter what, if I die during this, it's I, I'm not dying by not turning away from God. Like you've seen sometimes in the Bible, uh, you know, when they were hunting down uh, Jesus' prophets and everything, they would uh, they would deny the faith of Christ uh, just to save themselves from the Romans and everything. So that's a lesson I've learned. I can't do that. And when I know it's bad for me, I, I'm just very open about my faith and everything. And I think the sheer confidence or the dedication to my faith almost comes across as respectable to them to some degree. Um, or maybe I'm just very lucky, but they absolutely look after me and um, all the saints and everything, and God oversees me. I also bring my Bible with me, of course, and also one of these, some excellent stuff. So, yeah, so for those of you, this is just audio, but Miles just held up, um, him and I can see each other. Um, he held up yeah. his uh, 1962 uh, missile for the traditional Latin mass. Um, you can maybe, can, the only way to do it. The only, the only way to do it. Can you touch on that, Miles? Did... um. Were you always a Catholic? Were you always a traditional Catholic? Um, if you want to just maybe share a few lines about that, maybe. Oh no, I was I was an atheist until I would say seventeen at one point. So I was one of those edgy Reddit atheists that were talking about magical sky daddy and all this nonsense. Very very hateful love in a conflict. A lot of uh, you know hate from my uh, childhood, if that makes sense. And I always knew deep down there was a god. I I just couldn't balance with the idea but then uh, my life was put on the line not from Afghanistan or anything just from a very bad time in my childhood that kind of brought me into the faith that I'm very grateful for so I'm just glad it happens but I wish it happened sooner but it's God's plan sure sure divine providence with with all things so Miles uh, what would your message be to people who are afraid um, you know obviously you've taken some massive risks in life what would you say to those who are maybe holding back on something they want to do or they're afraid to make a leap of faith? You know, what advice would you have for, for those people? Well, I don't think you would be human if you weren't afraid. I mean, I'm afraid of doing all this stuff. I'm not some, you know, um, really brave adventurer. I, I take huge leaps of faith. And every time I land on a new country, that seems a little bit dangerous. My stomach churns and I feel the nerves. And I'm a little bit shaking. But at the same time, it's all part of it. And that's where the reward comes in because you're doing something that's very difficult and something that's hard to come by. Um, you know, these characteristics, you don't see humans too much, you know, courage, faith in Christ. Um, so what I would say is take baby steps first. Do Step out of your comfort zone. Do something good. Maybe have a friend with you because as, God, as Christ says, you've got to have a community to support one another. You know, Christians are meant to stick together. So maybe bring someone from your church or someone just from uh, one of your friends in general and then slowly build up from there. Make your goals clear. Pray as much as you can regarding it. Talk about the reason. So reason with God why you want to do this and so you can understand it yourself. And then eventually you'll grow into it. And with the power of God, you'll see leaps and bounds in your own faith that have brought you to a certain point in action in real life that you never thought you would go to. Because, yeah, you know, three years ago, I never thought I'd be going to Afghanistan. I thought I'd be going down the corporate route of becoming a humble banker or something and just living out my days, doing 90-hour weeks behind an Excel document. But look at me. Now I'm just going to war zones uh, for Twitter likes. So it's good stuff. Um, so if you want to go down that route, I honestly just say pray, have faith, and you know if something goes wrong, if something goes terminally wrong and, you know, you perish, it, say it's adventuring or whatever, you know you did it for a very good reason and you'll be building up gifts in the kingdom of heaven so rewards of the kingdom of heaven and from there it will be worth it the only thing is just consider your friends and family and how you make might make them feel um at least for me i'm a little bit lucky where um i'm a bit more independent uh, with my situation but you know just consider everything and think it through Sure. Well, Miles, it has been so neat to actually sit with you and talk with you and to hear some of your perspective on these things. So 
Um, we certainly hope you join us again sometime with so much more insight, with so much more, um, you know, details on these in- incredible journeys that you have. Anything you want to say really quick about them, walking the streets of London as compared to shooting with the Taliban? Oh, absolutely. London's very dangerous. But notice how London has become more non-Christian. It's become more dangerous yeah. and sinful. I mean, it's clearly a correlation causation right there. But then again, uh, London is now a Muslim country, unfortunately. So hopefully it'll return to its roots of a good Catholic nation under one roof and one God. That's right, Miles. Well, thank you for joining us, sir. It's great to have you. And we hope to chat with you again, Miles. So thank you. Thank you. I hope to be on soon. You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal, and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. At Majorum de Gloriam. All for the greater glory of God.